May the grace of God be active in all of your lives unto righteousness. May the Spirit of God make you righteous so that you are prepared to meet Him. The Spirit of God wants you to spend eternity with Him. And so He's got to get you ready for that. The Spirit of God has to get you ready for eternity. You've got to be ready for eternity. He's got to prepare you to stand before him forever and that means that there are responsibilities there are purification processes so there are processes of purification that prepare you so there are processes of purification that prepare you to spend eternity with god and so you've got to go through the processes of purification while you are in this life in order to be found righteous before Almighty God. He's got to purify you before he accepts you at an eternal level. So he's got to get you ready. And we've got, we've got various examples of that in God's word. But we are in Exodus, and yesterday, which was July the 15th, 2022, yesterday, July 15th, 2022, we were talking about the symbolism that was associated with the rod being thrown down to the ground. So as Moses is in the presence of, of God, the Spirit of God installs power for him to operate in the in the miraculous. And so God imparts power to Moses to operate in miracles. He empowers him to do that. So he gifts him with power to do miracles. And so Moses is to exhibit that power when told when told so as the spirit of god empowers us we've we've got to walk with him to the extent that we that we do what we're told and so the more power that you have the more sensitive to the voice of god you have to be the more power you have the more sober you have to be the more knowledge you have the holier you have to be, the more faithful you have to be, the more dedicated you have to be. We are living in a day and a time where people are under the impression that great amounts of knowledge and power from God absolve them of the nature of the Spirit of God. They believe that because they've got great amounts of power to do miracles, that they they can be like the world that they can be like the rebellious like the proud like the vain like the double-minded like the hypocritical it, 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 it's the exact opposite and so the more power the spirit of god gives us the more like jesus we are required to be and if we have great amounts of power and great amounts of knowledge without great amounts of humility, we are going to fail at the process of preparation when, uh, when we are judged for that which we were anointed with because the Spirit of God is anointing you. And that anointing is supposed to be conditioning you to spend forever with Him in, in power. And so... Moses is endued with power, and he, he has Aaron throw the rod onto the floor when standing before Pharaoh, and the serpent become or the rod becomes a serpent. We talked about that yesterday, the spiritual symbolism of that, the prophetic symbolism of that, the rod becoming a serpent, and what that means. And how it's a sign of God's redemption, but it's also a sign of God's judgment. 
because God is either going to redeem us or punish us. And both are forms of judgment. So redemption is a judgment. Judgment unto righteousness and punishment is judgment unto, unto condemnation. And so Pharaoh was given an option. Pharaoh was given a choice. You were either going to walk in righteousness by obeying this command or you're going to be condemned. And so that's what Pharaoh was faced with. And so the Egyptians throw their rods down and they also become serpents. And so Pharaoh is operating in pride. Uh, his magicians are able to copy the first three plagues or the first three signs. They're, they're able to replicate and to emulate the first three signs. They're able to throw their rods down, but Aaron's rod swallows up their rods, but they are able to do that measure of, of miraculous work. And Moses turns the water into blood. All right. He turns the water into blood. And the Egyptian magicians were able to do that too. They were able to do that too. And, and then Moses is commanded to bring forth frogs out of the river, bring frogs out of the river, the Egyptians are able to do that too. So they're able to replicate the first three miracles. They're able to do that. But that third miracle or that third sign of God's judgment on, on Pharaoh and the Egyptians was very, very burdensome. It brought great anxiety and grief to, to, to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So that's the first miracle that, 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 that affected Pharaoh's heart. Now, it, 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 it's also true that even though Pharaoh was rejecting Moses under the first two miracles, so he rejected Moses after the first miracle was performed, he rejected Moses. After the second miracle was performed, now, now that third miracle affected him, emotionally affected him psychologically, meaning the frogs brought so much grief. The frogs brought so much anxiety that he wanted Moses to go. He wanted Moses to fix the problem and go. He wanted, he, so he was finally letting Moses and the Hebrews go. In one sense, we could say that that was, that that miracle, that that form of judgment stood alone. In one sense, we could say that that form of judgment meant that that judgment affected Pharaoh by itself. We could say that the first miracle had no effect on him. You could say the second miracle had no effect on him, but that it was the third miracle that, that, that affected him to the extent that he was willing within limits to comply. But just because the Spirit of God, just because the Spirit of God shows us something, just because the Spirit of God shows us something, that doesn't mean he wasn't working before he demonstrated something that that seemed like it was more consistent with what man is looking for. So so the Hebrews are walking around Jericho. They're going to walk around Jericho 13 times total. They're going to walk around Jericho once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they're going to walk around Jericho seven times. And as they walk around Jericho seven times, they, the, they, they, they blow their trumpets and shout. And then the walls fall down flat. Well, uh, we, we, we can understand that each day they walked around Jericho, they, they weren't developing. There was no structural damage. So it wasn't, it didn't seem progressive. Sometimes your obedience, many times 
your obedience doesn't seem progressive in its effect on your life or on a situation. It could seem as though, let's use our graph here. It could seem as though you're not doing anything. It could seem as though your efforts aren't benefiting you. So imagine uh, I'm going to write here what, what we think, what we think, all right? And then I'm going to write what is. So there's a difference between what we think is happening and what is actually happening. So we think that nothing is happening until we get an answer. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's what we think. That's what we think. And so, so we think that we are told to do things and that as we are told to do those things, there's no effect un, un, until, you know, until we get an answer. So I'll write answer. So that way we understand what is happening. So we think nothing is happening until... We get an answer, but in actuality, that's not the case. All right. So let's see here. And so what? The, so the Holy Spirit did a scripture that says, "By long forbearance is a prince persuaded, and the soft tongue breaks the bone." The scripture says. By long forbearance is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. So, hopefully you can understand what that communicates. Now look at our graph here. Look at this example here. So, we think that we are told to seek and to circle. This is, this is what we think. This is how we see things. So, we think that we make decisions. You make a decision, nothing happens. You make a decision, nothing happens. So this flat line represents a circumstance or a condition of life that does not change. So nothing is happening. You're told to do something. There's no effect. You're told to do something. There's no effect. You're told so each of these lines represent actions on your part. Things you are doing and you think that absolutely nothing is changing and then something automatically changes. This, real, this, this point here is to communicate a, a change, a shift. Something happens. Something happens. Something happens and then, and then it completely elevates the circumstance. Things get better. But they all got better from that point forward. And now you're at a new level and... And now you make decisions and nothing happens. You make decisions and nothing happens until you're waiting for one of these moments again when there's an answer. So this is how we see things. We see our lives as flat. We see our decisions as fruitless. And I'm referring to those of you that are striving for righteousness and for those of you that are striving to see righteousness manifest. You might be trying to overcome sin or a sin. You might be trying to overcome an evil condition in your life. You might be trying to fulfill the work of the ministry and you might be serving God and it might seem like your obedient service to God is fruitless. And But as God answers a prayer, you might believe that he answered the prayer from that day forward or you or he brought change on that day but everything prior to that you were being ignored in that but in actuality uh you you every act every act was progressive in getting you to the point of the answer so every act takes you higher Every act, so these lines, remember these lines are representative of acts of obedience. You are living a life of faithfulness 
and you are doing what you are told and as you are doing what you are told, then the answer comes, refreshes your soul. And now you're at a new level, praise God. But but you are already elevating, developing, you are already growing because you were obeying. So every act of obedience gets you closer and closer and closer to where God wants to respond. And so the difference is you can't see. You can't see, you can't see the effects. Now, obviously, at times you can. At times you can see the effects of your obedience, but you can't see the effects many times of your obedience. And so what many people do is they stop obeying. That's what most people do. Most people stop obeying. They stop praying and stop obeying because they believe that their faithfulness is without merit. They believe their faithfulness is without value. It's without effect. And so they go off into sin as a result of discouragement. But the word of God says in Mark 13, 13, and in Matthew 24, it says we have to endure to the end. And so endurance is a critical component of eternal life. So we, we, will, we will reap if we faint not, meaning if we don't stop doing what we've been commanded of the Spirit of God to do. And so we are required of God to do whatever it is he's telling us to do until the promises of God are manifest in our lives. And so if we are unwilling to be faithful, then we're not going to see the manifestation of God's, of God's eternal, his eventual and eternal goodness in our lives or in a situation and in a situation. So every, every miracle that Moses does is developing the condition, though it doesn't seem like it is. So when Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, God knows that he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart, but something is being broken in the spirit. Something's being broken in that atmosphere because where the word of a king is, there is power and death and life are in the power of the tongue. So Moses goes to Pharaoh the very first time with the elders of Israel, tells Pharaoh, the Lord God of the Hebrews says, let, let, let us go so that we can serve him in the wilderness. God knows Pharaoh is going to say no. God does not tell Moses to go there and to pull out all of the stops. He doesn't go. He doesn't tell Moses to 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 warn Pharaoh that his firstborn son is going to die. God wants to manifest this work in increments, progressively in stages. God wants to work in stages. He doesn't want to create the earth in one day. He wants to do it in seven days. He wants to do what he's doing according to his will. Adam was born a man, created a man. Jesus was born an infant and he, and it took 30 years for him to start doing ministry. The spirit of God prefers to do things in stages. It doesn't matter how abrupt or how sudden it seemed. It can't, there was a progression. Now, there are certain things that God can, can just start, but everything he starts essentially is an expression, it's an outflow of him. So it's still progressive. He's still God. So the point that we need to hold to is that patience and faith and hope position us to know that even when it doesn't seem like God is working, he is working as long as you are working. If you are, are, are doing what you are told to do, then each act of obedience is developing, is, is leading you to where he wants you to go. You are walking 
as you are listening, seeking, and obeying. So you are going. You are going in a direction. Your decisions are taking you in a particular direction. So your decisions are, are, are leading you to where the Spirit of God wants you to be. So we're not to be weary in well-doing. We're not to despise the, the, the condition of life that we're in, knowing that there are promises of authority and victory for the righteous. As long as the righteous are, are, are operating in righteousness, the Spirit of God is going to make our lives better and better and better and better. And so every time, so God sends Moses to Pharaoh, knowing, knowing that Pharaoh is going to resist Moses. So then why would he send him? Because each time Moses goes to Pharaoh and releases the word of God, tells, tells Aaron to speak a particular word, there's a glory change. There's a change. The glory of God is being released. The glory of God is being released. So as Moses is doing that, the atmosphere is changing. Pharaoh's heart is affected. It doesn't, he, he doesn't have to feel it. Moses doesn't have to see it. But something has happened. Something has happened because the word of God does not return to God void. So if he commands his people to speak his word, if he commands his people to speak his word, a change has come. Now, changes start in the spirit before they manifest in the physical. So shifts start in the spirit. Plans are set in the spirit before they manifest in the natural. So God, God makes decisions and then he makes and then he prepares to execute that decision in the dimension in which he's going to execute it. He makes a decision and then he begins to, and he prepares to manifest the effects of the decisions he's made. So he, he, he tells Moses, go to Pharaoh, go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go until a particular moment. Well, then what are all of the moments prior to that for? It's for the conditioning of the person, of the atmosphere. It's to affect change that enables the final result. So there are things that have to happen before the thing happens. There are things that have to happen before the full manifestation. Before the full manifestation, there are stages through which we must pass. There are works that have to get done. So things have to get done before the fulfillment of the promise. That's why we are not to draw back. The Lord says his soul has no pleasure in those who draw back. That's why we walk by faith, not by sight, because sight will tell you that nothing is happening. If you are living according to the commands of Jesus, things are happening, meaning your world is being conditioned for the, the fulfillment of your purpose in it. And the fulfillment of your purpose is the fulfillment of pleasure in your life, the fulfillment of peace and love and pleasure. God is telling you what to do to gain access to him. God is telling you what to do to, to be promoted, to live eternally with him. He's telling you what to do. His instruction and your obedience to his instruction is manifesting his glory. It's manifesting his goodness. And so he, he tells Moses, go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is conditioned to say no. God has set him to say no. But when Moses goes to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh, let the Hebrews go according to the will and command of the God of the Hebrews. They've got to go three days into the wilderness to sacrifice unto God. As Moses tells Pharaoh that 
It doesn't matter that Pharaoh says no. It doesn't matter that Pharaoh begins to make life harder on the Hebrews. A change has come. So before the change manifests in the physical, it is happening in the spirit. And so Pharaoh says no. So Moses is sent back. Go back. And if Pharaoh says, show me a miracle. Because that's a change. In order to keep the righteous encouraged, the Lord can show you minor changes in a circumstance before the major changes. So there can be signs that there will be a major change. A change, and, and, and we're not just referring to change, we're referring to the fulfillment of God's promise. We're talking about the purpose the Spirit of God has stated that he's out to fulfill. So God wants to do what he's said he will do. There's a difference between you wanting God to do something and God doing what he has said he'd do. And so Moses, Moses is under instruction. He's under command. He, he's, he's, he's working a purpose God said he'd work. Moses isn't doing what he thinks God will do. Moses isn't seeking God to do what he'd like God to do. That's not what's happening here. Moses is doing what the Spirit of God has commanded him to do. That's the only way for you to know that what you are doing is going to manifest the purpose that you desire. You, you don't know what's going to happen unless the Spirit of God has told you what's going to happen. And we don't want to be confused. We don't want to think that God is promising us something that he isn't because there's a difference between what you desire God to do and what God has said he will do. That is why we serve God. That's why we obey God. Because God's going to give us the desires of our hearts as his sons who serve him. So as his sons who work his righteousness, as his good and faithful servants, we can expect God to do what he's promised to do because our hearts are changed after his heart, according to his heart. We are, we are, we are learning to walk with the Lord. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And because we delight ourselves in the Lord, because we delight in the Lord, because we delight in his word, because we delight in his will, because we are genuinely serving God in righteousness, our desires are the desires of the Lord and what we desire we can expect because we ask according to his will we think according to his will we operate we function according to his will if i'm not operating according to his will if i'm not thinking according to his will if i'm not walking according to his will then it doesn't matter what i want what i want is not going to manifest God is going to fulfill his will. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And so the Spirit of God is out to fulfill his will. So you've got to get in line. You've got to align with the will of God. If you are not in alignment with the will of God, then... You don't have hope. You don't have a hope. You don't have, uh, there's, there, there's no guarantee that the thing that you want to happen is going to happen. And so as long as we are in alignment with God's will and obeying his voice, as we are on our way to the fulfillment of his purposes in our lives, He's going to reveal the fact that we are on the right track. You're on the right track. I am going to bless you. Keep going. And so when Moses goes to Pharaoh the first time and there's a consequence, there's a, what do you call it? When, 
what do you, uh, retaliation. When there's retaliation, when something bad happens as a result of Moses going to Pharaoh, Moses questions whether he's in the will of God, whether it's still God's will to deliver the Hebrews, whether he's being deceived by God. Is he being led astray? And so God will give small signs, give small tokens of hope. He'll give small tokens of hope or big tokens of hope that are communicating where you're going. Don't worry. Things are changing. Keep going. So Moses goes back to God after the first time he's sent to Pharaoh and Pharaoh rejects their plea for deliverance and uh, things get worse. And Moses goes to God asking God if this is the change that should have happened. And God affirms Moses. He affirms him. He confirms the promise. Moses, and then God says to Moses, go to the elders. Moses goes to the elders, but the elders don't want to hear it. Did anything get done? Did anything happen? Well, we know something happened because Moses was told to do that. You can, you can guarantee that a work is, is done as long as you've been told to do what you've been doing. Now, is God blessing or is God cursing? You need to respect the fact that when you obey, you are being blessed. Every act of obedience is a storing up or a preparation to store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Eternal, permanent, glorious treasure. So you succeed when you obey. Now, you might not get what you think should happen. But if you do what you are told, rest assured that the purpose of God is going to be fulfilled. And if you fulfill the will of God and a purpose of God is manifest as a result of your obedience, you stand to gain. You are going to benefit. You are going to be rewarded. So if God says, David, go to this church and preach my word to them. If they don't get saved, if they don't commit to him, but I know I've heard, and when things get worse, I question God as to whether or not I've heard correctly, and God commands me to stay and to serve as he's said, I'm going to be rewarded. He's going to empower me with something. He might not save the people because he may not have ever told me that he's going to save them. But he did tell me to go and to speak his word, to minister according to his will. He did say that. But when I question the outcome, I've got to evaluate what the promise was. Wait, what did he say would happen as a result of my service. So many times people are confused concerning what's happening in their lives because there's a difference between what they want and what God is saying he's going to do. There's a difference between what people want and what God is promising to do. So that's why the meek are going to inherit the earth. That's why the poor in spirit are going to get the kingdom. Because the poor in spirit, they want what God wants. They sense, they detect, they discern, they can hear the will of God. They can sense the will of God. They agree with the will of God. They're not out to get their will done. They're not trying to get their will done. They're trying to get God's will done. They love God. They love God's will. They love God's purpose. They're not proud. They're not rebellious. They're not idolatrous or vain. They love God. They want God's will done. And so when God makes his will known to them, they are in agreement with God's will. 
They're, they're in agreement with God's will. They're not fighting against the will of God, trying to get their will done, trying to make things as they think things should be. No, they're submissive to the will of God. How can we walk together unless we agree? How can I walk with a God I disagree with? I can't. I can't. Unless I agree with the Spirit of God, I'm not going to see the will of God done in my life or in the earth. So what I think should be done isn't always the will of God. And dependent upon where you are in your stages of life, it might never be the will of God. Jesus says, or the word of God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth. That's how high my thoughts are. That's how separate my thoughts are from your thoughts. So there's a huge difference between the thoughts of the Lord and the thoughts of man. The desires of the Lord and the desires of man. But the desires of God are the ones that are going to be fulfilled. So sons of God are supposed to want the will of God done. Sons of God, I have come to do your will, O oh God. Teach me to do your will. Your spirit is good. So, so we hear the will of God and we do it. That's what Jesus told the woman. The woman said to Jesus, blessed, it, blessed are the breasts that nursed you. Blessed are the breasts that nursed you. Jesus said, yes, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. That's what Jesus is saying. She's saying the, 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 your mother is greatly honorable. Jesus said, yes, but those who obey the father's will, they are greatly honorable. They're great in honor. So you, so we need not to fight against the will of God. We cannot, must not fight the will of God. You cannot fight the will of God and prosper. You cannot think that something's going to happen, some goal is going to, is going to be reached. You can't think you're going to get something that God isn't giving you. You can't get what God isn't giving you. And if you get what God's not giving you, you, you are not going to have peace. So... Whatever you get that you did not get from God, whatever you have, whatever you get that you do not get from God, it's going to curse your life. If you get something that God did not give you, that thing is going to curse you because it's not yours. It is not yours. You don't have the power to possess it. It's not yours. You should have what the spirit of God is giving you. Because then it'll bless your life. If you have that which is not yours, you can't maintain it. So every so Moses is told to go to Pharaoh. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let the Hebrews go. The Hebrews, uh, Pharaoh rejects it. But something was released. The Lord says, go to the Hebrews and tell them that I'm come down, that I've come down to deliver them. Moses is reluctant, but God wants to release something onto these Hebrews. So Moses and Aaron go. They tell the Hebrews what God has promised again. Go release this promise over them. People aren't always going to hear. People aren't always going to agree. The question is, have you been told to do what you're doing? And so as Moses goes and as Moses releases that word, see, Fear will tell you not to release the word. Unbelief will tell you not to release the word. I'm not saying everyone's hearing clearly from God. I'm saying that those who are hearing clearly from God have responsibilities. We're going to have false prophets all over the place. So we can't be afraid of the fact that people are going to share false words, false dreams, false visions false revelation that's going to happen and it's going to happen more and more and more what's the wheat to the chaff what's the seed to the shell yes most people are going to be a shell most people are not going to have power most people are not going to have knowledge most people are not going to have 
faith in God, they're not going to be connected to Jesus. And the numbers of those people, the ratio of wicked to righteous is going to grow. So if there's two wicked people and one righteous man, before Jesus comes back, it's going to be 200 false prophets to one godly prophet, if not more. So the amount of false prophets is going to increase. The proportion of false prophets, false dreamers, false brothers, false pastors, false teachers is going to progressively increase until Jesus comes. You better respect that. You better respect the fact that as we get closer to the return of Jesus, the false preacher, false teacher, false apostle, false prophet, the amount of false churches is going to grow in comparison to the real church. Why can't we understand that? Why don't we accept that as true? We just can't believe it. We just can't believe it. We can't believe it. It, it. it just doesn't resonate with us. Just, our hearts just don't tell us it's true. But it is. Jesus said it. He died on the cross for our sins and resurrected him on the third day. And he's still distributing power. And Jesus said that in the days leading up to my return, the, the amount, the proportion of false prophets, false teachers, false brothers is going to increase. That's what he's saying. He's not saying it's all good, it's all God, as long as they're preaching Jesus. That's not what he's saying. So the Spirit of God doesn't want you to be a fool. He doesn't want you to live like a fool. Because if you live like a fool, he's going to treat you like you are worthless. You're just a car accident away from eternal punishment. You're just a sickness away from eternal punishment. You're just an accident. You just, you know what I mean? Do you want that? No, you don't want that. You don't want God to just treat you like you're worthless. You're a paper cut away from some crazy, strange disease that kills you. No, you don't want that. You need to understand that what Jesus is saying is what Jesus is doing. It doesn't matter what it, what it looks like, what it feels like to your soul. Jesus is saying he's Jesus is saying he's going to progressively increase the number of false prophets in the earth, in the churches. That's what Jesus is saying he's going to do. He's saying he's going to do that. How, 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 how can you stop that? You, you better not be among them. You better not be one of them. But he is doing that. He's doing that. And so Jesus, tell, the Lord tells Moses, go, go to the Pharaoh and tell him this. He's going to say no. Do what I've said. And he, he, and he goes, he has to do it. And then he says, go to the Hebrews and tell them I'm going to deliver them. And give them more detail. And Moses does. The Hebrews are too discouraged to listen. Moses is confused. Because in our natural minds, we think that the fulfillment of the promise should immediately appear it should, it should immediately manifest that's not what he's doing many times go and tell them this god doesn't tell moses they're going to resist him they do but god doesn't tell moses they're going to resist him because ultimately they're going to accept him so go and tell them that i i'm going to deliver them and keep my promise to their ancestor abraham and he does. And they resist him. And then after that, God says, go and tell Pharaoh again to let the Hebrews go. And now Moses is getting another command. But but the Hebrews didn't even listen. What, what, there's no proof that Pharaoh's going to listen. Go, you and Aaron, and tell Pharaoh this. And if he asks for a miracle, because things are changing, if he asks for a miracle do this and they do it and pharaoh resists it and then he says go and meet pharaoh at the river go meet pharaoh at the river and tell him thus says the god of the hebrews let the hebrews go and god knows pharaoh's going to say no he's conditioned pharaoh's heart to say no but every time moses releases the word and performs a miracle 
There's a shift, a shaking, a shaping, a changing in the atmosphere. Everything Moses does is conditioning his world and the people of it to experience a dramatic change. So there are going to be minor changes, some seen, most unseen, until the major change comes. So he goes, curses the land with blood seven days. That's conditioning. That's affecting things. That's affecting things. Then he says, go to Pharaoh. Tell him, let the Hebrews go and warn him that if he does not let the Hebrews go, you are going to curse the land with frogs, frogs everywhere. It's going to be so burdensome to the soul. T tell them that. Moses does. Pharaoh rejects. The land is cursed with frogs. The magicians, the Egyptian magicians can do the same thing. Except for, remember, that's not really an impressive thing. That they can duplicate the miracle. Because it's a curse. It's a curse. It's making the people... It's terrifying the people. It's terrifying the people. It, 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 it's, 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 it's vexing their souls unto death. And so they're terrified. They're terrified. They don't want frogs everywhere. One frog over there is one thing. Four frogs there, 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 and there is another thing. Frogs everywhere, just no matter where you look, they're all over you. They, you know, they're, the, 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 the deafening sound of, of them croaking, it's too much. It's too much. All of these are conditioning the circumstance for God to do the big things he's promised to do. So God has to walk us to where we're going. He's got to walk us to where we're going. So, 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 he, so he goes, he, he does that. And, then, and, and now that the frogs are vexing Pharaoh's soul, now that the frogs are vexing Pharaoh's soul, Pharaoh says, okay, 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 uh, I'll let the Hebrews go. This is not the first time. This is not the first time. This is not the first time. This is. Uh, this is a, This is. This is. Uh, this is the third time he's talked to Pharaoh. One, two, three, fourth time he's talked to Pharaoh. This is the fourth time he's talked to Pharaoh. So when Pharaoh says, "Okay, you can. You guys can go. You. You all can leave. You can. You can leave. You have my authority. You can leave. Just. Just. Take away this curse." Each time Moses was talking to Pharaoh, it was moving him to that decision. Even though Pharaoh wasn't as sincere as he was saying he was, the Spirit of God was developing the circumstance to, 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 to work this ultimate purpose. And so then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me, and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, glory over me. When will I entreat for you and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the river only? That phrase, glory over me. What's he saying? He's saying, I'll give you the right to decide when this happens. Glory over me. You first. You above me. Tell me when you'd like me to do this. So Moses is feeling more confident because Pharaoh is breaking. There's a breaking. A breaking just happened. The first three times Moses is there, Pharaoh is adamant. He's seeing it, it seems as though no change is going to happen. But now that Moses is starting to affect the nation in such a major way, now Pharaoh's heart is being conditioned to say yes. It's not conditioned to say yes. It's being conditioned to say yes. And he says, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to your word, that you may know that there is none like to the Lord our God. Moses is now talking with more confidence. Why? Because progress, the as the Lord does more work through you, he's He's supposed to be doing more work in you, or there's more work being done in you. As God does more work through his people, he's doing more work in his people. As God does more work in his people, he's doing more work through his people. And so it works both ways. It works both ways. 
And so Moses is feeling more confident in his God. He's feeling more confident that his God is the, is the true God because he hasn't even known God for very long. And the frogs will depart from you and from your houses and from your servants and from your people. They will remain in the river only. Moses is feeling more like a prophet. He's feeling more like he has control. He's feeling more confident in his God. Now, the ruler of the whole nation, of the region, is yielding to him. That's encouraging. It's encouraging him. That's why God will work in small ways to remind you that the promise he's made you is going to manifest. So that you don't get tired, so that you don't get weary, so that you don't give up, you don't forfeit that which God has promised. And so Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, verse 12, and Moses cried to the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The word of God says he performs the counsel of his messengers. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together on heaps, and the land stank. A very foul odor. If you've not smelled one dead frog, then you can't imagine what thousands of dead frogs throughout a land could smell like. I don't think any of us could imagine that. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite or relief, his, he hardened his heart and hearkened not to them as the Lord had said. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and on beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he hearkened not to them as the Lord had said. And so now Pharaoh... He goes back, he reneges on his promise to free the Hebrews. But that's not a discouraging event because God tells Moses, Pharaoh is not going to let the Hebrews go. You can imagine that there was some excitement in Moses believing that maybe Pharaoh is going to let the Hebrews go. Maybe the Lord won't have to do everything he's promising to do. Maybe Pharaoh is actually going to let the people go. Maybe Pharaoh is, is more humble than God has said he is. Man questions whether or not God's word is true. And so when God says A, but shows you B, then you say, well, maybe A is not actual, you know, because look at what happens. God could say that person over there is open to my truth. But they might not be exhibiting that. And, and so you might go there and try to talk to them about the truth of God. And then they could exhibit uh, just resistance to what you said. And you could say, but Lord, I thought you said. As long as you don't get discouraged at doing what he said, you're going to see the change he's promising will happen. And so, or it could work the other way. God could say that person over there is not open to my truth. Your generation isn't open to my truth. A person could posture as though he's open to the truth. It could seem as though God is going to, to bless. I remember there was a situation where the Lord was saying, this person is not one of my people. I'm not working in that person. And then I had visions of that person being restored to an extent. And so uh, I got communication that said the person is not faithful and will not be 
of any value to the kingdom. And that came from the Lord. But then there was some communication that may, that I understood to mean that there was some restoration, some possibility of restoration. And that's what I expected. I expected that. But instead of doing, uh, instead of God doing that, he did the first thing he showed me. And so I questioned, well, why did, why, why, why was there, what, what was the significance of these other images, these other dreams or visions? Were they from God? What, what were these other visions? I thought, I know you said you're going to bring judgment, but after you said that, I saw some other things that told me that you were not going to do what you showed me. You know, one of the things about God that can be very, very difficult for us to grasp and to understand is that God's counting method is different than yours. You count in forms of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. God doesn't count like that. He does, but it doesn't. I sh maybe I should say he doesn't talk like he counts. And so he'll do one. Or he might say, you know, he might say ten. One. God might do ten. One, two, three, seven, eight, four, five, nine. And six, I think I have all the numbers there. God can count like that. Yeah, 10, 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 4, 5, 9, 6. He can count like that. He can count like that. He can tell you the, the end from the very beginning. 10. Whoa. Really, Lord? Yes, 10. I'm telling you, this is what it is. Okay. And then the very next thing he shows you is 1. See, everything is good. Whoa, what happened? I thought you said, yes, I did say that. And then he shows you the second progression of things, too. Okay, so things are good. Three. Okay. Seven. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's more consistent with the first thing I saw. What happened with that? God can do that. God can do that. Yeah, God's counting. Yeah, 10, 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 4, 5, 9. Yeah, God can do that. God can say, this is what I'm doing. And then show you something else. That's how the histories in the, in the Bible is written many times. You read the book of Judges. That's a 400-year history of the Hebrews. But the events aren't necessarily in order. That's what you, you read the prophets. You'll see that the order of those events can be all over the place. He's going, he's going to destroy Jerusalem. He's going to bless them. He's going to destroy them, destroy them, bless them. Bless them, destroy them. But what, when is he going to? Yes, it can, it can bring great confusion. That's what the book of Revelation, that's how that book is written. It's written in prophetic order. God doesn't always speak, often speak in chronological order. He speaks according to what he wants you to focus on. So he could say that person is a dead man. That, and he can, in the same about the same person, you could say that person is a friendly person. So he's friendly. Is he a friendly person? He's a dead man. He speaks to you according to what he wants to say, according to what he wants you to focus on. Focus on this. Don't focus on that. Focus on this. Okay. Yeah, God will speak to you according to what he wants you to focus on. God will speak to you according to what he wants you to focus on. So God will talk to you according to what he wants you to focus on. That's why you have to walk with him. You have to, if you want to be prepared for anything, you have to walk with Jesus. You have to obey his voice and you have to stay close to him. If you are one of those people who like to wander and who like to fight with him, who like to ignore him, you're going to be a fool. Your life is going to manifest that you are a fool and a rejected person. If you want to be accepted, people stay very close to God because they know at any point in time he could say something that greatly affects 
their lives and everything around them. Well, no, 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 no. I don't like embarrassment. I don't like shame. I don't like to... I don't like rejection or abandonment. I don't like pain or suffering. I like peace and joy and love. I like knowledge and stability. I don't like being an outcast by God. I want him to tell me things that are going to enable me to operate in basic peace. I, I need peace. Oh, yeah? Well, you better listen. If you want peace, you better listen or I'm going to, you're just not going to have it. You're just not going to have it. God speaks to you, brothers and sisters, in the faith according to what he wants you to focus on. It doesn't matter what. So what he did say is the context, but what he says is what he wants you to focus on. Don't focus on that. Focus on what I am saying. I know I said something, but focus on what I am saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We we rely on him. We trust him. We we you have to. You have to. You don't have a choice. If you want peace, you have to obey. And so Moses probably thought that God was wrong about Pharaoh. Moses probably thought that God was going to actually free the Hebrews. Whoa. Lord, maybe you don't have to do everything you said you do. Lord, have you changed your mind? Pharaoh said, "Yes, we can go." Oh, he said yes, did he? Yeah, he said yes. Okay. Well, just go ahead and do what it is I tell you to do. Don't look at things according to how they seem. There's a difference between what things what things seem like and what they are. No, that's not what you think. That isn't what you think. That that's what I've said. Don't look at the outward appearance. Don't look at it. Don't look at the circumstantial state of things. Listen. Listen to my voice. Listen to my voice every day. Don't reference what I said five years ago if you're not hearing me still. Because you don't know if I've changed my mind. If you've distanced yourself and you don't know what I'm saying, then you don't know what I'm saying. If you continue in my word, then will we know. Then will we know if we follow on to know. Then will we know if we follow on to know the Lord. You cannot know if you don't follow. You cannot know. You cannot. You can't know. You can't know. You have to follow to know. Balaam did not follow. That's why Balaam did not know. He didn't know because he wasn't the follower. There's a difference between the knowers and the followers. Followers ultimately know. Not everybody who knows is a follower. You know, so if, if, you, if you, God's talking to many people. He's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And most of them are not going to spend eternity on earth with him. So you, you want to be a follower of Jesus. All the followers are going to know. Not every knower is going to follow. And in order to be where Jesus is, is you got to follow his voice. His voice is where his voice is going to take you. His voice is going to take you to where he's, to where he is. His voice is going to take you to where he is. So that's all the time we have for today. Jesus is preparing you for his return He's preparing you to stand before him forever and righteousness will examine more of this according to God's will in the future. May the Lord give you the wisdom necessary to apply this word in Jesus name.